Well, hello everyone, it's Dr. Zizzy again. Appreciate you taking time to check out the podcast for Unit 1. What we try to do, uh, what I'm going to try to do in each of these lectures is take you through the slides in addition to uh, a couple uh, websites here today and give you the best overview of the material that I can so that you have a better grasp of concepts, theories, and then uh, getting key points from each of the units. And so you can expect that each of these podcasts, well, they last somewhere around 45 to 60 minutes. And, of course, you could pause them if you need to go somewhere else, or you can download them if you want, put them on your phone uh, and listen to them later, or watch them on uh, um, some other media if you want. So you can interact with them in any way you want. And that way, if you didn't really understand one of the theories or one of the points, or you can you know go back and play it over again, which I guess is a is a pretty big benefit relative to a normal class. If you miss the lecture, you miss the lecture. Uh, whereas these will be present for you. Um, so yeah, take your time, listen to them, uh, and then of course if you have questions after you've uh, gone through each unit, then feel free to drop me an email and uh, I'll try to you know get one back to you. Um, so to start off this particular unit, this is going to focus on the big picture of exercise psychology basically exercise psych 101 and what we're going to look at today are some of the key trends with physical activity obesity other health behaviors and some of the main reasons for why this is occurring and why basically it's occurred over the last 20 to 25 years so for many of you you know college age students my assumption you between the time you were born and right now, this is when this big problem of health behavior has occurred. So I don't want to put the blame on you guys or anything, but um, that's when it's occurred. So it's not so, it's, occurred, it's occurred quite rapidly, where obesity and, and uh, these issues have, have doubled um, since approximately 1990. And so we're going to look at some of the factors that have contributed to that, uh, to, to those trends. Uh, we're also going to look at the major theories, um, psychological theories, for why people behave the way they do. So that if you end up as a personal trainer, an athletic trainer, a physical therapist, a sports psychologist, a counselor, somebody who's working with other folks trying to change their health behavior, then you might have a better understanding of how to go about doing that. Because honestly, the theories are one of the most useful things that uh, I've ever come across uh, in my work. Um, Obviously, my job is a professor. You know, primarily I teach courses like this. I do research, uh, but I also have a you know a practice where I work with I worked with plenty of athletes on the performance side, and you guys have already taken some of those classes. But on this side, I've worked with a lot of older adults uh, and kids, and helping them change their physical activity and diet behaviors, uh, and also work with folks with, for weight loss, and have been doing that for a while. So I have a lot of actual real world experience, and these theories translate well. So I know as a student, sometimes reading the theory, uh, it's not too exciting, but you're just going to have to trust me that these theories are, are, are useful, and uh, we'll try to link them up, and you have some opportunities later on in this class to look at some case studies and um, apply the theories as well. So let's go ahead and get going. Uh, and I do apologize in advance if there's any interruptions or if my phone rings. I'll just pause the podcast for a moment, but I am recording them in my office, and today I will say is a absolutely miserable spring day, pouring rain, and about 48 degrees in, in May, so I'm not real impressed with the weather today, so just a good day to be inside talking to you guys. Um, exercise psychology as a formal field evolved out of sports psychology, um, public health is also another a large area field, and so sports psych researchers started using exercise participants, those people they had access to in gyms or rec centers, and then they were taking these concepts from sports psychology, if you look at the bottom point down here, self-efficacy, imagery, anxiety, depression, and they instead of working with athletes, they started to work with people who are recreational exercisers. You know, if you think of the terms physical activity or sport, I mean, physical activity is really a larger, a broader term, right? So sport is one form of physical activity. But you can also be uh, physically active by gardening, by walking, by working a job that requires a lot of physical activity. So physical activity, honestly, exercise is the parent field 
and sports psychology is more of the sub-discipline. But unfortunately, in our major here at WVU in sports psych, uh, mo most of the emphasis and the interest is in sport. A lot of students really like that side, but this particular course is going to focus on the other side. That is basically non-competitive forms of physical activity. Um, about 30 years ago, like before you guys were born, uh, right around the time I was born in the 70s, uh, there was very little uh, emphasis on being physically active in leisure time. I mean, a lot of people were still working in factories, had jobs that required physical activity, but in the digital age here, starting in the 80s and 90s, many people, including your parents probably, worked jobs where they didn't get a lot of physical activity. They sat, they worked with computers, they did different types of jobs, and the heavy lifting was shipped overseas. So that really changed. That was one of the biggest environmental changes that has occurred in your in your uh, generation. And as a reflection of that, um, you know, economically, your generation is the first generation to have as many dual uh, career parents. So you're more likely than any other generation to have two parents working full time, which influences a lot of environmental factors, including time available to be physically active, um, choices that people make and has forced this whole idea of convenience uh, culture into the American uh, existence, really. You know, the question of exercise psychology, if you have a look at this, looks at this from two angles. So in the middle, and I've entitled this antecedents and consequences, you have your being physically active or not, and it, here we call it an acute or chronic physical activity behavior. And that really refers to an acute session just means you know going to the gym one time, being active, walking for 30 minutes. An acute short session or chronic meaning regular physical activity. And we'll get at what that means a little later on in this lecture. So the majority of exercise psych researchers, questions, study this from one of two angles. Either the influence of these type of psychosocial factors and demographic factors on whether or not you're active in one session or chronically or the post side of it which would be how does being physically active affect psychosocial outcomes such as these listed over here so this is you can kind of think of these as precursors or antecedents and on the other side these would be consequences of exercise so um, exercise psychology as a field studies these types of questions okay and you know many of these things have a huge impact on a lot of people relative to sport psychology now trust me my 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 initial interest in sport and exercise psych was sport related I loved athletes I wanted to work with Olympic athletes um, but you can imagine that's a very small population so imagine my job was to work with Olympic athletes I mean there are a few hundred maybe a thousand you know Olympic athletes in any given summer or uh, winter games and then maybe another couple thousand trying to qualify. But if you, let's say I, the, I'm studying weight loss, well as you'll see in a minute, there's millions and millions of people, including several hundred thousand in West Virginia, that may be interested in a weight loss intervention. And so the, the population and the impact that you're able to have in exercise psychology is much broader. Does it make it better or worse? Uh, it's just a different kind of question. Okay. Um, Looking at some of the, let's make this a little bit bigger, it's a little easier to read for you. Um, some of the key behavioral stats here, if you have a look at this, is that about half, 45 to 50 percent of people, are regularly active. So the definitions here, and you should definitely be familiar with these, five days a week of at least 30 minutes, or three days a week of 20 minutes, and then it only differs whether you're doing moderate or vigorous physical activity. Uh, moderate meaning uh, like a brisk walk uh, where you're taking a walk at approximately three to four miles per hour. Vigorous meaning you know something the equivalent of full court basketball, jogging, running, um, something more intense where you can't really keep your breath uh, and have a conversation. So about half. So you could look at that depending if you're optimistic or pessimistic. As a good stat, hey we're doing okay, it's not as bad as we thought. Or whatever. Uh, you could say, oh, this is terrible. It's probably not terrible. You know, about half. So if you think about the population of the United States, you're looking at about 300 million people. And of those, you can think, ah, oh, there's probably at least 200 million adults. So that means about 100 million adults uh, are not getting enough physical activity to be healthy. Okay, so 
That's, that's a lot of people, obviously, in, in this country. Uh, we do even worse with uh, fruits and vegetables. We get about one-fourth uh, of the population of adults consume five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, uh, and there's a lot of benefits of doing so. Uh, and then in terms of obesity, which we'll look at here in a second, uh, about two out of every three people in the country is overweight or obese. Uh, and, and about right now, about 25 to 30 percent of that, 66, is obesity. And I should say that it's not necessarily an issue to be overweight, which is basically about 25 pounds, within 25 pounds of what you're expected to weigh, that would be overweight. There haven't been a lot of good studies to show that that's a problem in the sense that it causes you to die. Uh, but with obesity, uh, it's basically a comorbid condition uh, with almost every chronic uh, health problem. Okay, so that's the current snapshot, and we'll have a look at some uh, some of the obesity patterns here in just a moment to get more detail on those obesity rates. Okay, you know this problem is not due to uh, lack of education, uh, and many of you guys in uh, your health classes certainly learned about it. Uh, many of your parents are college educated, uh, yet are inactive. Okay, so. There have been studies in West Virginia in third, fourth, fifth grade kids, and they'll get numbers like this, 84%, 90% of them know, yes, what fruits and vegetables are, yes, they're good to eat, yes, I should be physically active, that's an important thing. So it, it's, it's not that folks don't know, but it's a combination of factors that we need to understand more. It's also not that we're lazy. You know, this is a big... Um, easy way to us just say, oh, that's just lazy, or a you know, common thing is, oh, those parents just shouldn't let their kids be active, or they, I'm sorry, they shouldn't let their kids watch so much TV. Uh, well, that's an easy answer, but it's wrong. It may contribute to that. Yeah, maybe the parents do need to be a little bit better about uh, not buying all frozen fruits and feeding them chicken nuggets and mac and cheese every night. Okay, that, that might be part of it. But, let's face it, if, you're, if you've got enough physical activity, you could eat whatever the heck you want as a kid. It may not be great for your nutrition, but you wouldn't gain weight. So, obesity, don't ever forget, is two-pronged. It is eating too much, not getting enough activity. It's a combination of those two behaviors. And then, so we have to really look at what are the factors that contribute to eating more calories? And then what are the factors that contribute to not getting as much physical activity? And there are a variety of factors, not just individual ones. There's situational, uh, environmental factors as well. Um, some demographics here, you know, minorities, those with less education and lower income, SES stands for socioeconomic status, they're less likely to be active. And the, basically the big picture there is that the, in their environment, they have less opportunities and less access to be active. So they, they, maybe they can't pay for a gym membership. Maybe they live in a community that's not safe for walking outside. Maybe their kids don't have bikes. Maybe they go to schools where uh, physical education is not provided. So they have less access to resources. Um, and the next unit, we're going to look more also at how the impact of the environment, how the environment in which you live, the physical environment, can affect the likelihood of you being uh, physically active. So we'll get into some more of that as well. You know, in your lifetime, and it's one of the things that's hard to give a picture of if you're sitting there as a 20-year-old because that's all you've known, but you might think about what has really changed um, in the last 20 to 3 years. So the strange thing is that in those 23-year period, with the exception of maybe the last 2 to 3 years, I mean, the economy has exploded and people have done well. And in fact, your generation had access to more stuff than any other generation before in terms of cars and video games and technology, and those came out of people working. Uh, there were more facilities built, not less. Okay, so there are more parks, there are more gyms, uh, bigger schools with bigger you know, uh, basketball gyms and walking tracks and football stadiums. And then there's you know, been millions and millions of dollars spent on campaigns educating people that you should exercise. So during that time period, basically physical activity rates have stayed the same and we've gotten a lot heavier. So we might think about why has that occurred? Uh, at the same time, this convenience culture has come across in this some of this way. So more people are working and that's eight hours a day of sitting down in front of a computer or on a phone. Um, car travel, you know, except when gas was four dollars a gallon, is very common. Uh, in addition to that, we've built lots more roads and put a lot of money into roads as opposed to trains so more people are going to you know, spend time on their car uh, everything at home is easier and you're less likely to spend effort doing it um, 
access to high calorie resources is very easy, kind of the 7-Eleven effect. You know, if you think of Morgantown being here, going from the Coliseum just over to the football stadium, think about how many opportunities you have to stop for fast food just on that stretch of road down Pattison Drive. Just the change of what do you have access to easily. If you're a college student and you're walking by Jimmy John's downtown every day, easy access to that, and then you get to 12-inch sub because you know it's it's affordable. Um, you get maybe more calories than you need very easily. Okay, you go to 7-Eleven, you can buy a you know a 40-ounce Mountain Dew, gets 500 calories, drink it in a half hour because you're thirsty, and you have gotten basically nothing out of that. So our access to a lot of those things has, has increased dramatically. And then everything else, technology has really just made it easier for us to be sedentary. So it's not the fact it's so simple as a you know, common thing students will say is, well, there's just too many video games now. Okay, that's the easy answer, but it's wrong. Okay, it's absolutely wrong. Um, because just because you have video games, I grew up in a video game generation, I played a ton as a kid, there's no reason that cat kid couldn't be playing video games and be playing sports. You know, if you play video games for five hours a day, that doesn't make you fat. Okay, you could have been out running three miles, but prior to that, and gotten your physical activity, you might eat healthy and play video games. And I have some nieces and nephews that are the skinniest active kids you ever meet. They love video games. They play them all the time. But the fact is they balance it out. So don't be fooled by the simple answer to this question. Oh, that's why kids are, are, are fat these days. No, it's not. That's not the answer to the question. Okay? It's a combination of individual factors and the change in the environment which has made it much more difficult. So when you read uh, Food Fight, I want you to really pay attention to the arguments they make about how this has occurred. Now, the secondary issue is that um, people are now dying from things that are not uh, infectious diseases. So we're doing a really good job at health care in our country, and we've doubled the population over the last like 60 or 70 years. So, however, one side effect of this um, economic prosperity or growth that's basically happened since the Second World War when we came back from Europe is gluttony. Now we have an access, an access to resources that a lot of people don't have in developing countries and therefore we're more likely to overindulge. Gluttony being the sin. So if there is any American sin, and I've been lucky enough to travel internationally, I've uh, been on about I think four or five continents now, you know, I can tell you we have everything bigger and, and better. Uh, I can tell you one uh, quick story. Like I remember being in Italy uh, in 2004, and I was just dying for a soda. I don't drink too much soda, but sometimes it's just, you know something you really want. Um, and so we stopped at this McDonald's on a road trip in Italy, and I ordered a large. Um, this is really not that long ago, right? Now, how large would that large be here at McDonald's? I mean, how supersized big would that be? I think you can get at least a liter, like 32 ounces, maybe more, uh, if you want, in a large. And I was looking for, it was a really hot day, I just wanted a big Coke or a Diet Coke. I can't even remember what I, what I ordered. Uh, and they brought me out the largest cup that they had, and it was 12 ounces. So you're talking about the largest cup at that McDonald's was the size of a can of soda. So, you know, that's just a simple example of portion size and how we've changed. And so now you go out to a restaurant, you get a portion, and many people that have come to the States, and we've interacted with lots of international people in the last few years, they're really stunned by the amount of food that gets put in front of Americans. And so our concept of portions and the type of food is one of those. And so what I'm really trying to emphasize is the cultural factors that are different here in America that you would not be able to really see unless you get an opportunity to go somewhere else. So if you have not traveled and you have the opportunity, you should definitely go. It really doesn't matter where you go. South America, Europe, Asia, you should just go so that when you come back you can see with a different clarity. Um, and I'll be glad to you know, talk to you more about some of those issues. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're now dying from preventable causes. These things are smoking, high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, uh, CHD stands for coronary heart disease, which is one of the biggest killers along with cancer. And physical activity is really linked to improvements in, in nearly all of these things. And so many of the things we're dying of from are, quote, preventable. 
Therefore, exercise has the possibility to prevent those things as well as to treat some of these issues. And therefore, it's a, it's a quality and quantity issue where exercise can improve the quality of life so that you don't have to go and be in a doctor's office all the time. And it definitely can improve the quantity of life as well. There have been a variety of research studies out there that show that being physically active gets you somewhere between three and seven years of extra life. Now, maybe at a young age that doesn't make a lot of sense or doesn't mean, but I can guarantee you at 78 that three to seven years might be really important to you. So it's really hard to kind of get perspective on that. But let's say your granddaughter is going to get married in two years. Well, that three years would matter a whole lot to you at that time period. Um, or you're going to see your great-grandchildren. Or you're not because of the choices that you've made uh, throughout the course of your adult life. Okay. You guys probably already know a lot of the stuff about being active. Um, some of the things that it does that will help you die, not die, if we get down to the, the main point, is it's going to help you maintain your weight. It's the number one factor that helps with weight loss and weight maintenance. It's daily physical activity. Um, it strengthens basically all your systems, your cardiovascular system, your heart, your bones, your lungs, your cardiopulmonary system. Uh, it's going to reduce the risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease, keep you from clotting up, and then it controls your blood pressure, your blood sugar levels, and how your body interacts with insulin. So all of those things from as simple as walking 30 minutes a day. Okay, so you don't need to go to the gym. You don't need to be necessarily lifting weights, although you can get different benefits from that. Uh, we're talking about 30 minutes a day of moderate physical activity can get you these things. In addition to those things, the psychological part is helps you to calm down, reduces anxiety, improves your mood, um, stress management, it may improve your sleep, uh, and then also you, you know, generally people are feeling stronger and more confident throughout the, that as well. So that's a lot of benefits. Now let's have a look at, what we're going to take a look now is a data that's compiled by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they collect this data every year by doing random digit phone calls uh, across all the states. So the, the name of the survey is called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's a standard survey. They call people up, they get demographic information, and then they find out about um, what kind of behaviors they're engaging in. So many of this, much of this data is self-report. Um, so some of the obesity stuff that we have, for example, if let's say people are lying and they're reporting that they weigh less than they do. Well, then maybe many of these trends I might show you might actually be underestimates, which is a little bit scary, you know, once you see what we're going to have a look at. And you should be thinking about how will this impact you if the trend's not reversed, because you guys are going into the workforce here in the next five years, and you're going to start paying health insurance. Once you start seeing how much money you pay for health insurance, it's going to blow your mind uh, because of how much it takes out of your bottom line. And the reason I want to emphasize that is if everyone continues to get less healthy, health insurance costs more for everyone. So while the classic American belief that, well, I can be fat if I want, I can eat as many, many french fries as I want, and I can smoke right after it too and have a Coca-Cola, because that's my right. All right, to some degree, that's true. It is your right. We do live in a free country where you can choose it. However... Uh, if you're on health insurance and I'm on your health insurance, I pay more because of you. Because the costs are going to go up. So we're all in this together. And until we figure that part out, and I don't think we're going to socialize health care in the United States. It would be a riot in Washington. But there are many other countries where there are socialized health care and socialized education, and it works out a lot better than our private industry. So in private industry, the less healthy everyone is, the more people are going to have to pay. Let's have a look at some of this trend information here, okay? So what I want you to focus on is, let's go back here just to maybe around when you guys were born, okay? So we're going to have a look at this map. And uh, you can see that, let me just clue you into the what you're looking at. In 1990, they started collecting a lot of this information just a few years before 1990. And the colors represent the percent of folks who are obese in each of the states. And you can see a few states that had yet collected this information. So I'm just going to click forward until 
uh, when we have data for everyone. Okay, so now every state the data has been collected. So this is 1994, which is you're looking about 15 years ago. Okay, not that long ago. Many of you were like maybe around kindergarten age. Certainly not much more than first or second grade. Uh, and some of you maybe were, uh, you know, even younger than that. Okay, at that time, you can see the majority of states, this light blue color, I'm looking about 10 to 14 percent obesity. And then the worst states were 15 to 19 percent. And if you want to check this site out, by the way, let me just pull the site down for just a moment here so you can check it out. You might be able to pull that in. So if you look up um, cdc.gov or CDC um, obesity, you'll find a lot more of this information if you want to do some research on your own as well. Okay. Okay, so now let's, let's just come forward to uh, the year 2000. So I'm going to click through and show you what's happening on a year-to-year -year basis from 1994. Let's go, <coughs> excuse me, five years forward. 